She was one of the best war correspondents of the 20th century. For six decades, journalist Martha Gellhorn covered nearly every major conflict across the globe, excelling and trailblazing in what was, very much at the time, a man's world. She was also an accomplished fiction writer who happened to be Ernest Hemingway's third wife and the only one to ever leave him, which makes her intriguing. Our next guest is breathing new life into Martha Gellhorn through the pages of her new historical fiction, Love and Ruin. Author Paula McLean joins us in studio this morning. Good to have you here. Thank you so much. I was just sharing with you how much I love The Paris Wife. Thank you. And this picks up uh, in, so, in so many incredible ways. Let's talk about The Paris Wife because you said you were inspired by a quote from Ernest Hemingway. He said, I wish I had died before I ever loved anyone but her. Was that the basis for The Paris Wife? And was there a similar line that inspired this new book, Love and Ruin? Oh, what an interesting question. So yes, that's what he said about his first wife, Hadley Richardson. Mm -hmm. And I learned about them when I first read Ernest Hemingway's memoir, A Movable Feast, and became so intrigued by their relationship. But mostly what he doesn't say about it is what I wanted to know. And so mm -hmm. I just went looking for them and sort of feeling, I don't know, rather um, heartbroken by their whole story. With Martha and Ernest, honestly, the whole book idea came to me when I had this crazy dream a few years ago where I was fishing with Hemingway in the Gulf Stream wow. and she was on board, Martha, and she was hand feeding a marlin that had crested up out of the Gulf Stream. And the next morning I thought, what was that? Like, was wow. that some sort of a sign? And so I Googled her and read her Wikipedia page. And within about five minutes, I knew I was gonna write about her. What did you love about her? Her raw physical courage, her social conscience, her conviction, the way that she did all these incredible things at a time when women certainly didn't do that. They still don't, by the way. They still don't go to war very often. She was really an original, a true original. Uh, it's a fictionalized version of her life, but right. it, it, it does have a lot of historical research to it. And in fact, part of that research was going down to Hemingway's house in Cuba. What was in that like? Cuba. What did you learn? Absolutely amazing. So she's the one who found uh, his house, the Finca Vigia, in 1939 and, and loved it and uh, sort of renovated it, sort of saved it from the jungle. Mm. He lived there until 1960 when Fidel Castro took over and when he left, uh, basically left everything that's still in the house, so it's all there. Furniture she picked out in 1939, 10,000 books, like furniture. Wow. His shoes are in the closet and his glasses are on the nightstand oh, and amazing. it's all still there. So being there was sort of like being in a time machine, sort of so preserved and so extraordinary. Uh, she is widely considered to be one of the best uh, war correspondence of her time, which is incredible given the fact that she was a woman. I mean, women weren't even allowed to fight in wars, and there she was covering yeah, absolutely. them. Absolutely, and there were all these restrictions about women being at the front, etc. But she was uh, so scrappy and had such nerve and such chutzpah and did all sorts of things that women don't do and that people don't do, really. Which I imagine was what attracted Hemingway to her in the first place. Her independence, uh, her bravery. Yes, but I love this. In the book you point out, at one point he blocks her press accreditation, and so she has to smuggle herself onto a hospital ship in order to cover D-Day. Did Day. that happen? It really did happen that she did that, that she started away on a hospital bar. She locked herself in the john. She drank a bunch of whiskey, and when she woke up the next day, she found that she was sort of had a front row seat to, wow. the, to the battle at Normandy, and there were 150,000 men on Omaha Beach and one woman, and it was Martha Gellhorn. What was it that did not work between these two? They're both fiction writers. They're both, they both covered wars. They were both ambitious and creative and did things their I own way. I think they were too much alike. Oh. I think they were too much alike. They were big personalities. And they wanted the same things. They each wanted their work and their career and to have love and stability and security. And, you know, you can't have everything. The blocking of the press accreditation uh, made me feel like Hemingway was a bit of a jerk. He was, mostly he felt abandoned by her. He couldn't really understand why she would choose her work over him. Mm. He was an incredibly sensitive person and yes, and a difficult one for sure. What kind of impact did they have on each other? Oh goodness, well I think he both mentored her as a writer, particularly when they first met, you know, when she went over to the Spanish Civil War, he encouraged her to be a correspondent, but then later I think he stood in her way. He really wanted her to be his wife and his... He wanted to own all that. He did, he want, <laughs> yes, he did. All right, it is a fantastic read. Thank you so much. Um, and it's called Love and Ruin. Love Thank and you for Ruin. bringing us through the story. Are you done with Hemingway now? I hope so. Okay, we'll see. <laughs> Any more dreams pop up? We'll see. <laughs> Thank you.